Dear chess fans, in this video we are going to check out the game of world champion Ding Li Ren playing with the white pieces against world's number three, Hikaru Nakamura. It's a big game, but most of all it's very, very interesting. So I would like to take you through the highlights, the critical moments of this game. And there is something big on the line. We will talk about it later. You want to see this video for sure, but probably you want to see more videos as well. So do hit the subscribe button, give this video a like. And if you like my videos about Norway chess or all the other videos as well, please consider making a small donation. Really appreciate all your support. Thanks guys. Now it's time to have a look at the game as Ding opens up with 1d4 and we can expect that he wants to play in a very solid manner because in the previous two rounds he lost both his games against uh, Caruana which I also covered on the channel and against um, Alireza Firusha. so Ding going to play solid Hikaru will probably smell some uh, some blood now play the move d5 Ding goes for the move um, c4 and here another small surprise or maybe not a big surprise but Hikaru deviates from the main lines of the Queen's Gambit by playing his pet variation, the move uh, c5. And uh, he has been playing it in quite a number of uh, online games. But also recently at the uh, FIDE Candidates tournament in Toronto, he had exactly the same position with the moves knight f3 and knight f6 inserted in his game against uh, Pragnananda. It was a key, key game for, for Hikaru to, uh, to win and to get back into the into the leading pack we know that he didn't win to didn't manage to win the event uh, in in the end but um it's interesting to see how uh ding uh, copes uh, with this uh, idea uh, pawn takes d5 is played and of course black can uh, can just take back with the queen on uh, d5 but here probably the most interesting uh, move um possible here is knight f6 this is definitely an, uh, a small surprise, has not been seen very often at, uh, at Grandmaster level. And probably this also comes as a huge surprise to, uh, to Ding. Uh, Black is flexible, he can take back with the Queen, he can also consider taking back with the Knight. After Knight c3, taking with the Queen is not an option, so Black does indeed take with the Knight. And uh, well here, various options, you may consider a move like, uh, like e4. Instead Ding goes for the move uh, Knight f3. Pawn takes d4, queen takes d4. This is actually a position you can also reach via one uh, knight f3. It's something I've been analyzing uh, some years ago. So we are back in some sort of uh, mainline uh, theory. Knight takes c3, queen takes c3, knight c6. So a symmetrical position to open files. White has already brought out its queen to, um, to c3, but he does have lead in development. Plays here the move e4. And uh, okay, it's clear that white has, uh, has a space advantage. And thanks to the queen on uh, c3, it will be quite difficult for black actually to uh, get out that bishop from, uh, from f8. Here, another interesting moment. Most of the games, they continued here with e6. But the drawback is that the bishop can no longer be developed to an, uh, to an active uh, square like g4. So what uh, Hikaru does, is here the move a6 so it ever forever prevents the move bishop um, b5 developing the bishop with gain of time to to hit the knight on uh, c6 and okay the bishop got to go to another square but the question is of course which bishop you're going to develop first maybe the bishop from c1 to any of uh, these uh, squares or the bishop on f1 first anyway bishop e2 was played and now Hikaru reveals the idea of his previous move as he goes for e5, activating the bishop from f8. And it should be obvious now that knight takes e5 is a big blunder on account of bishop to b4 and white is losing the queen because of this uh, skewer. So after e5, Dink played the move a3, covering the b4 square. Bishop comes out to, uh, to g4. And that's also very interesting and active uh, play by Hikaru. As he says, please take my pawn on e5. But Ding didn't like to, to take the pawn. Probably the reason is that after bishop takes bishop, king has to recapture. And uh, there is knight d4 check. The king is stuck in the center. Next move, there will be rook c8. With a lot of uh, peace activity being... Uh, generated by uh, Black's uh, forces. So that's something 
you would uh, certainly like to avoid as um, as white. White castled instead. And here, rook to c8 played. Very logical move to uh, prepare some discovered attack on the queen. Like knight d4 is on the agenda. And what, uh, what should be played uh, now? Well, it's clear that with the queen on c3, now white has to be very, very careful, as it could be that you'll be forced to spend a number of more uh, moves with, uh, with the same piece while you're stuck with your uh, queenside uh, development. And I think here Ding makes the, the first uh, serious inaccurate uh, decision of the game by playing the move queen b3. Very understandable. He moves the queen away from the uh, c file and hit the pawn on b7. But there are some uh, drawbacks we will uh, discuss very soon. First, I want to show you that bishop c4 is the best move in the position according to the machine. Probably uh, it, it just feels bad to place your bishop on the, uh, on the same uh, file. There are potential uh, problems. Black can uh, just continue developing with a quite an acceptable uh, game for black. It's just important that the obvious uh, move, the, the ideal move here, b5, is not really possible uh, because of knight takes e5 with threat against the bishop on uh, g4. And therefore, white has time to neglect uh, the threat against the bishop on c4. If you take on e5, queen takes e5, you recapture with check. And uh, on the next move, you just move the bishop away. And white is a very, very big pawn up. So bishop c4 is a more active way of uh, playing. But as I said, it was not uh, played by Ding. He instead played queen b3. But the problem is knight to a5. Attacking the queen... And the queen doesn't have that many good squares to, uh, to go to. For instance, if you go to e3, there's bishop c5 with tempo. So instead, the queen went to a4 with check. But now b5 is played anyway, attacking the, the queen. The queen now has to go back to, uh, to d1. But you see that so many queen moves have been uh, played in, uh, in the opening. And black is actually um, fine to, uh, to trade off uh, queens here. Um, so that um, you're you're very active with uh, with already one rook on the on the open file. The question is how to take back as white. You can take back with the bishop, so the that doesn't look great for the for the rook. Rook cannot come to the d file, but at least you manage to keep the knight out from the b3 square. In the game, though, um, there followed rook takes d1, but after knight to b3, you gotta watch out for a double attack. Rook has to go to b1. And now the bishop comes to c5. Active play once again. The pawn on e5 is not really hanging because in that case the bishop on e2 will be captured, which explains Ding's next move as he goes king f1, protecting the bishop on e2. So now knight takes e5 is a serious move to reckon with. f6 played, protecting the pawn. And now white says, okay, that knight on b3, that's a really a nuisance. I need to, to get rid of that. So... Rook d3 played, attacking the, the knight. And the bishop, well, it has done its job on, uh, on g4. It goes back to e6, supporting the knight on b3. And since the knight is beautifully placed in white's position, it's still very difficult to, uh, to entangle. Now, I was following the game. And honestly, I was expecting here white to go bishop e3. Uh, just to be sure that the bishop uh, joins play and uh, the rook can, uh, can join play as well. But it also doesn't solve uh, White's problems. I want to show you why this was not played by Ding. But here in this position, after something like king e7, you can't really take on, um, on uh, c5 because of knight takes with a double attack against the rook and the pawn. If the rook goes to e3, then the other rook comes to the open file with huge advantage here. These rooks are super active. And the rook from b1 cannot easily go anywhere else. There are always problems regarding uh, your queenside uh, pawns or potential infiltration of, um, of one of the rooks. So black is in great shape here. Anyway, bishop e3 not played. Knight e2 is another plan to try to get rid of uh, black's best piece. But the knight now comes to d4. So you keep the pressure against the bishop. White goes b4. Taking the bishop on c5, bishop to b6, bishop to b2. So, okay, black is uh, still clearly better. But it uh, looks like white is almost there. But it's very concrete. Knight takes e2 
had been uh, played by Hikaru. King takes e2 and the king comes to e7. Looks like a slow move, but okay, black has managed to get the two bishops. And even though everything is still protected at this point, uh, black is just having a great time on the c-file with ideas to enter the second rank. Well, in case you go for something like rook c1, was not played in the game, but it's important to understand why this was not played. You can exchange one pair of rooks, the other rook will come over to uh, hit the bishop. And now you cannot retain control over the c-file, preventing the rook from entering because the pawn on f2 is hanging. Well, in case you, you just move the bishop away, then there is rook c2. And now you see that this rook on b1 is missing. It was uh, actually defending the, the bishop on uh, b2. If you do move the bishop away, there is bishop c4 with a huge uh, skewer. You're winning the exchange or probably even, uh, even more. So... Um, now you, you understand that there are some uh, serious problems when a black rook enters in, uh, in white's position. Therefore, f3 was played so that the pawn on f2 will never, never be hanging uh, again. And, and still, there are moves like uh, g5 with the idea to open up a new front with g4 or maybe try to, uh, to push even, uh, even further. Uh, black is having uh, the upper hand on uh, on both sides of the board. And as we have seen, the rook cannot easily uh, activate itself because after that, the bishop on b2 will not get the support it uh, it needs. Anyway, Hikaru played here rook to, uh, to c2. Very logical move uh, with the idea to get the other rook over to c8. Rook c3 played, trying to uh, exchange one pair of rooks, but the bishop comes in to c4 with check. The knight is pinned, cannot take the bishop on c4. King goes back to e1. But now look at this, bishop f2 check. Beautiful uh, idea. If you take the bishop, the king no longer defends the knight. As rook takes d2, king goes away and then rook hd8. And this looks miserable for, uh, for white. With the idea to move the rook, let's say to e2. Then the other rook can come in with ideas to get two rooks. On the uh, second rank, this is uh, almost game over. Instead, King D1 was uh, played. Now, Rook is under threat. You gotta exchange Rooks on C3. White recaptures Rook to D8, pinning the uh, Knight on um, on D2. And also, the King can't go really anywhere. If the King goes to C2, it is Bishop to D3 with an, um, a skewer winning the exchange. Rook goes to A1, looking for counterplay but the drawback is bishop to f1 look at this this bishop tickles the pawn on g2 making use of the fact that uh, the knight on d2 is still uh, pinned white had to go for g3 now bishop comes to e3 still everything is defended but white can barely move for instance if you try to get out of the pin on the d file with a move like king e1 was not ding's uh, choice there is bishop to g2 with the idea to take Eliminate the knight on d2, followed by winning the pawns on f3 and e4. But the key idea in this line that must have been calculated from afar by Hikaru is that after king e2 attacking the bishop, there is bishop takes d2, bishop takes back. And now it is bishop takes f3 with another nice deflection uh, tactic. You're winning a pawn and, uh, and the game because this rook end game is just really, really bad. Anyway. King e1 was not played. White is looking for counterplay. With the move a4, black captured the pawn. Rook takes back, but the pawn on a6 still defended by this bishop on f1. Anyway, bishop goes back to hit the rook. Rook goes back as well. And now the rook comes into d3. Beautiful cooperation of uh, black's uh, forces. You're hitting the bishop. Bishop can't go back because the bishop also got to keep the knight supported. Rook to c1 is played. And now I really enjoyed seeing Hikaru's next move. He went for the move h5. Very nice classy move, highlighting the misplacement of uh, White's forces. They can barely move. Look at the king. If the king goes to, uh, to e2, then you place yourself in a pin. It's rook takes c3. Discovered attack, winning the game. There's not much else you can, uh, can do. In fact, if you do go uh, rook c2, there's bishop a4 at least. Also winning uh, the exchange. King c2 was played. But it's, um, it's too late. Now, Bishop is still defending the Rook. It's time to eliminate the main defender of the pawn on f3. That is pawn number one. And Black is still super active with a Rook 
and okay opposite colored bishops but most importantly that pawn on e4 is a long-term weakness rook e1 played to uh, anticipate bishop d3 check which uh, could have won the pawn if the rook is not uh, there anyway black um, has different ways of playing can even try to force matters here with a move like h4 with the point of trying to create more pawn weaknesses very soon all these pawns are going to be uh, removed instead bishop c6 was played Keeping an eye on the pawn. Rook e3. Interesting moment. Um, offering the exchange of rooks. Black can actually take on uh, e3 and take on e4. But you know, in general, pure opposite color bishop endings. They have a more drawing uh, tendency. Probably the position is still winning for, uh, for black. But instead, Hikaru felt like, okay, my rook is just more active than, uh, than his. Just uh, keep, keep them on the board. Attacking the pawn on um, h2, white goes h4, bishop a4, check, king c3. And now, no rush, just activate the king. This rook is uh, kind of forced to uh, maintain control over the pawn on uh, e4. Rook e1, rook g2, that's another pawn weakness. Rook e3, now g6. So here you see that white pieces, they are sort of uh, stuck here. Bishop e1, bishop to b5, king b3 played. What else to uh, to do? Bishop to e2. Bishop becomes more active. Bishop uh, c3 played. Now the rook comes to uh, to f2. King c2. Bishop g4. Discover check. Bishop d2. Bishop e2. Looks like white is holding here. Black is not making too much progress. But black is not in a rush as I uh, said. Bishop c3. Bishop f3. Once again discover check. King d3. Bishop g2. Beautiful idea. The bishop is fantastically placed here. Keeping an eye on the pawn and introducing a new plan. Because after rook e1, they follow the move g5. And this is uh, why the bishop should be on g2. Because black uh, is hoping white is going to take on g5. And if you keep making um, uh, waiting uh, moves like uh, bishop d2, then the pawn will come to h4. And the pawn is unstoppable. This bishop controls the promotion square and the h3 square as well. That is, uh, that is just going to be a game over. While, for instance... If you uh, play instead of um, uh, bishop d2, something like rook e3, there's even bishop f1. And the king is caught in some sort of a mating net. White will be forced to give up the rook in that case. So taking on, e5, uh, taking on g5 is not an, uh, a reasonable uh, idea. But the game's continuation isn't uh, much better either. Bishop d2 played, attacking the pawn on uh, g5. Pawn takes h4, pawn takes back. Bishop to f1 check if the king comes to e3 to hit the rook the rook is going to f4 that's a good square and you see that there is the new weakness the pawn on h4 can no longer be defended of course you first got to move the bishop but then you will win a second pawn in any case king c3 was uh, played now the bishop goes to uh, to e2 bishop to e3 hitting the rook rook now goes to h2 hitting the pawn from a different angle bishop to c5 and before taking the pawn, because the bishop is hanging, you do first move the bishop away. And uh, there's nothing you can do. You cannot defend the pawn on uh, h4. So Hikaru is going to win another pawn. It's pawn number two, probably pawn number three is going to drop as well. Or at least you will create an, uh, a past, uh, past h pawn. So that should also be sufficient. But anyway, after this move, Ding Liren resigned. Third consecutive uh, loss. Very Bizarre, but most importantly, uh, Hikaru is now crossing 2800 again. I think the last time was somewhere about uh, 10 years ago, something like 2014, 2015, if I'm not uh, mistaken. And um, well, anyway, that is very impressive. So that makes him world's number two, leapfrogging um, Fabiano Caruano, at least for the moment. So perhaps Hikaru has a chance later in the tournament to get closer to... Um, to world's number one, Magnus Carlsen as well. And also with this loss, now Ding Liren, the world champion, is no longer in the top 10. That's absolutely uh, bizarre. I think he dropped now uh, to uh, number 13 spot in the world. But who knows? Uh, it's, it's painful to see a world champion performing so badly for uh, more than just one, uh, one tournament. He is definitely not himself again let's see if he can bounce back let's see if nakamura is able to uh, make further steps closing in on uh, world's number one magnus Carlsen. thanks for watching this video hit the subscribe button like this video and i will see you very soon again thanks for watching bye bye